it going. Can you hear that? Great. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming. And most important, uh, please join me in welcoming Ben Weiser for coming all the way to Toronto. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Ben, we're, we're going to have a bit of a conversation, you and me, and then uh, open it up to the audience that came out tonight. I'm, I'm really impressed. So many people came out to see this. Uh, it's fantastic. Wow. Okay. Stunning. That's fantastic. Listen, uh, Ben, the first thing I, that I want to ask you is, um, can you tell us a bit about how you came to represent Ed and what the process was around that for you as an attorney? It's, it's just obviously the biggest case for you ever, I would assume. The biggest and strangest, yeah. Uh, the, I think the most important point to make about that is that um, Ed wasn't able to consult with me or with any attorney uh, in all the time leading up to that incredible hour that we see in the film in Toronto. He had to undertake to do this all on his own. And he couldn't risk uh, either his own safety or the safety of somebody else by bringing somebody else in. So if people have questions about why did you do this, why did you do that, don't ask me, uh, ask him. Uh, the first time he and I contacted each other directly was in July of 2013 when he was already uh, stranded for 40 days in the Sheremetyevo airport in Moscow. Uh, the first time I learned his name was when all of you learned his name, when the Guardian film, this incredible video was broadcast on the Guardian website that went to Putin's world. However, um, I did know uh, more than you before you. Um, when Laura got the, Laura Poitras, the filmmaker, got the first email from Citizen Four, uh, which she narrates, film, um, I was one of the people who she came to uh, with the question, what the hell is going on? Um, is this um, perhaps a trap? Is this a crazy person? Um, or is this possibly um, one of the most important whistleblowers in American history? Um, we didn't have any reason to believe C at that point, except it seemed legitimate. Uh, and so she and I were in regular contact between January when he got that first email and uh, late May when he learned I'd been bailed out and had to go back to Russia. I did know that she was going there uh, in the hopes of meeting with Laura, but none of us could have anticipated what happened next. Uh, when it became clear that, that Ed would need his own lawyer, um, Laura Poitras and Gwen Greenwald both came up to me and said, no, 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 no. I recommend that you not do this. Um, I think this is working now. So. Could you please enlighten us on, on the status of the legal charges right now? There's a discussion, a fascinating discussion about the Espionage Act under which he was tried, and, or charged, sorry. And uh, I'm wondering now, what is the status of all of that? And we'll maybe answer that first. So it's, so it's unchanged. In, in, in the days after Snowden revealed his identity to the world and to the FBI at that point, uh, as the, the whistleblower responsible for these leaks, um, the government put out a charge sheet uh, charging him with three violations of the Espionage Act of 1917. Uh, they needed to do that so that they could then send requests through Interpol and to every other country in the world for extradition should he turn up there. Uh, so it was really kind of a placeholder just to get those charges out there uh, internationally. Um, there has since then been a grand jury. Um, we have reason to believe that it's still intact. Se secret grand jury. Well, yeah. grand juries are secret. The grand juries are secret. Yeah, yeah, that's not unusual. Um, if there's an indictment, we don't know about it. Um, but we, we do know that, so, so he was charged with three violations of the Espionage Act. He could be charged with dozens or hundreds. Um, uh, you know, they could independently charge him for each document uh, that was provided to journalists. Uh, the, 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 the scope of his exposure is virtually limitless, and as I explained, He doesn't really have a defense that he could mount uh, to those charges in court because uh, what he has already said he did is enough to convict him under the Espionage Act. Uh, the fact that these journalists won top prizes, the fact that uh, actually since this film, uh, a U.S. court has struck down uh, one of these programs as illegal, Congress, the United States Congress, uh, passed a law that for the first time since 1970, the U.S. Supreme Court has established the, <laughs> the surveillance authority of the intelligence community in the United States. 
all of this stuff directly flowing from his actions, none of it would be relevant or even admissible uh, in a trial under the U.S. Constitution. And so uh, the situation in the U.S. is fairly frozen. Um, I, I won't comment on the details. Obviously, there's been a, a dialogue between our team and the government about possible non-trial resolutions. And if we were close together on that, maybe you would see progress or not. Um, and then his status in Russia is that after one year of asylum, his status was converted to um, legal permanent residence, the equivalent of what we would call in the U.S. a green card. So that that's leads to my next question. I mean, many of us who look at this situation and wonder about his status, obviously Russia is not an ideal place to be for someone like that. And, and you wonder about the perilous kind of fickle nature of, of this agreement that you talked about. How much of a concern is that for you as his... I guess I would put it another way, which is, what are his options? Um, right now, there are two places where we know that he's allowed to be. Um, the second is in a maximum security prison cell in the United States uh, under special administrative measures, probably in a communications management unit. I would have to sign a non-disclosure agreement to even be able to talk to him. He would be cut off um, from the world entirely and not able to participate in the extraordinary global debate we've seen in the last few years that he helped to launch. The first is Russia. Uh, if, there's, if there's a third, I'm not aware of it. Uh, and so it's, it's not a question of whether I would feel happier, more secure. Um, he would feel less conflicted uh, if he were elsewhere. Um, the fact is there isn't plan C right now. Now, uh, some of you might have seen that a couple of months ago, the European Parliament um, voted, uh, a majority of uh, members of the European Parliament voted to call on member states not to extradite Snowden if he were to turn up and in those countries, but that's not binding. Uh, that's a decision that's made at the state level, not at the European Parliament level. It's obviously extremely important. Uh, it has huge symbolic uh, importance that they did that, and our hope is that there will be a time, uh, we don't know how long it will take, uh, when he'll be welcome in countries um, other than you know, Russia or a U.S. prison. So speaking hypothetically, I know you can't get into the details of this, but there are, are, are there countries more than other countries that would be desirable from this perspective that would actively resist that type of extradition, that would not succumb to some kind of pressure that you can see internationally? Yeah, at, at the moment, it's hard to say. Uh, you know, no such country has stepped forward in Europe. There were countries um, in Latin America that had offered grants of asylum, but of course there's the question of how he would get there. Um, without transiting through a country that has an extradition agreement. I mean, this is why he ended up in Russia. He had an offer of asylum from Ecuador, and if you try to get from Hong Kong to Ecuador without going through a U.S. extradition country, your route is Moscow-Havana. Uh, th there really wasn't any other way for him to, to get there. And now, so, uh, and, and you know, and whether he would take the risk um, of, of going from, uh, you know, the security that he has now uh, in Russia to go to Latin America, it's, it's hard to say. Um, look, I think that the most important factor here um, is time um, for a number of reasons. I think that in general, time and history are kind to whistleblowers. The importance of their revelation grows. The claims of national security that are so hysterical and so common and so repetitive um, don't age very well. Uh, people say all these calamitous things that were supposed to happen didn't happen. There was diplomatic awkwardness. There's no question that the U.S. intelligence community has damaged relationships with technology companies. I would call that a feature, not a bug, um, uh, uh, of this, right? No, and I mean that. Um, I think that's good for democracy when you have multi-billion dollar corporations adverse to the security state and not working hand in glove and um, behind closed doors. Um, but, but I do think that, that in time, you know, as his, as his work continues to be recognized, as he continues to be, um, such a remarkable global citizen. You know, his work doesn't stop in June of 2013. Um, every week he is uh, engaging with citizens around the world in some kind of public forum. Um, he is a board member at the Freedom of the Press Foundation. He's working uh, with uh, some people you know on developing secure tools. He's doing engineering work. Um, so I, I really do think that, uh, that in time, uh, the notion that he should be punished as a felon for his contributions will come to seem absurd almost everywhere in the world. 
I want to turn next to the question of whistleblowers and protections for whistleblowers in the United States, how that's changed, and whether his act, do you think that will inspire other whistleblowers to take action? I mean, we see at the end of the film the second whistleblower is not the third or so on. How do you evaluate the whistleblower environment in the United States? You know, I don't expect that there's going to be any legal reform. Uh, I think that if it were up to the U.S. Congress, the punishment for people who do what he did would be uh, harsher, not more lenient. So, so we won't see those kinds of reforms. Even if we did, um, anyone in the intelligence community who undertakes to share this kind of information with the public um, uh, is risking a lot. You know, so even without the Espionage Act and the prospect of 30 or 50 or 100 years in prison, um, you really give up your profession uh, if you come forward. Uh, you have to have a security clearance in order to do this kind of work in the United States. Millions of people have it. If that's revoked, and it can be revoked purely at the discretion of the executive, um, you really lose your ability to work. You might lose your family, your community. So, uh, so it's always going to be um, extremely exceptional for people to do what a Daniel Ellsberg or a Chelsea Manning uh, or an Edward Snowden came forward to do. Um, will it be as exceptional? Will we have to wait decades between these events? Uh, it does seem like the time is getting compressed uh, a little bit. Uh, as you say, we see this whistleblower at the end of the film. Um, if any of you saw The Intercept, um, which is the publication that John Greenwald and Laura Polk has been on for Forum, uh, and Jeremy Scahill, they recently published a series called The Drone Papers, um, uh, which is a product of that last scene that you see. And so, um, you know, I, I do think that, that we're likely to, to see more, uh, but, but not a lot, and, uh, and I don't have a lot of confidence that the legal situation will be improved to make it more routine. So for you personally, what, was, what has been the single biggest revelation for you coming out of this, or was there? I mean, you know, for, I, I know personally speaking, I, as a professional engaging this topic, some of it was not surprising, and, and I'm speaking as someone who you know spent my entire life trying to better understand signals intelligence. To see the full scope was really uh, dumbfounding to me. Uh, what about for you? What did you think about as you poured through these stories tonight? Yeah, I guess for me, the most remarkable and most surprising story was the first one. Uh, the one that you see unfolding in the film. Uh, so the very first story that Greenwald publishes in The Guardian is uh, about a document, and the document is a secret order um, from the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court to a company called Verizon Business Partners, um, ordering the company to turn over on a daily basis all the telephony metadata of all of its customers. Um, and this was so brazenly inconsistent with what the top officials had said under oath in Congress. So I'm accustomed to officials uh, concealing information from the public. Um, I'm accustomed to officials lying about things that we know about. Um, but, but this, I mean, the idea that, that someone like James Clapper, someone like Keith Alexander, these people could raise their hands in Congress, be asked a, di be asked a direct question, uh, and then lie about it with the confidence that this would never come out, when obviously many people in government know about it, um, you know, to me was extraordinary. It was also, uh, you know, as a lawyer, the most significant document. In, in the first conversation that I had with Edward in July of 2013, one of his first questions for me was, do you, the ACLU, have standing in this case? You saw the argument in court uh, in the beginning of this film. He had been watching the legal challenges that, that, that lawyers like me had been trying to bring over the years. And every single one of those challenges to, to NSA programs was thrown out, not because the court agreed with what the NSA was doing, but because they said that we had no right to be in court because we had no proof that the surveillance programs touched us. Um, and in March of 2013, just a few months before um, he came forward, the Supreme Court in a five to four decision in the case called Amnesty International versus Clapper that you brought up, um, reached that decision, um, said you can't challenge this kind of program. Um, so here his question was, do you have standing now? And it turned out that he had given us a ticket to federal court. Um, and in May of 2015, really for the first time, um, a federal appellate court in the United States considered 
whether the NSA program was legal or illegal and said in a 100-page decision, it's illegal and it's always been illegal. And so, so that was both the most surprising and the most gratifying. So one, one last thing before we get out to, to the audience that I know has, uh, probably has a lot of questions that they want to ask you as well. For me, when I, I often get asked this about what is, you know, what, what have been the consequences of all of this? Are, are they positive? Or can you see some maybe negative consequences? And I, I do think in, in passage of time, Snowden will be seen as a hero for opening up this conversation, which has been long overdue. But in the short term, you can see uh, some unintended ne negative consequences. One that I've observed has been other countries around the world who now, uh, with this opening up, are uh, quickly adopting, building their own NSAs, I would say, and uh, uh, building borders around uh, around the internet. And I wonder if, the, the other one I've, I've noticed myself is also been a bit disappointed by the public reaction. I haven't seen, especially in this country, uh, an uproar about this, although I have to say the, the audience, the, the size of the audience here gives me uh, maybe dampens that a little bit. How, how do you feel about the consequences of all of this? The so, fallout? so let me start this way. Um, you know, Snowden wants everyone to understand that his principal message was not about surveillance. His principal message was about democratic participation. Uh, that the most important thing for him um, was to, as he puts it, return this information to the public, to whom it belonged that the most offensive practice was not any particular surveillance program, but the fact that the government built and deployed this entire architecture without any democratic consultation. Um, so the fact that there has been a global conversation, uh, quite unlike the kind of debates about these things before the Snowden revelation, um, is itself a critical consequence, even if we're not satisfied with the results in some places. And by the way, those have been inconsistent. Um, in the United States, we have had historic reforms. Isn't that interesting? Uh, you know, the country that was the uh, you know, sort of principal bad actor in deploying this architecture also has had um, a much better debate about it than you've had in Canada, than you've had in the UK, than you've had in Australia, or any other five Eyes countries. Technology companies that you mentioned, too, they're reacting. Well, the technology so. companies are American for the most part. Um, and so, yes, I mean, I, I actually think g getting to what the consequences have been and not just the fact that there is a debate. You know, what I alluded to before, that the technology companies through which we, you know, communicate with each other and experience the world, um, essentially woke up to a different threat model than the one that they had, you know, designed their platforms for. Um, maybe some of them were less surprised than we were, but they were a little surprised. Um, and, and I know that journalists who have spoken to people in these companies security engineers have told stories about them swearing when they, when they saw these things. Uh, Bart Gelman, the Washington Post reporter, uh, in, in one of his stories said that when he showed this slide to Google engineers, um, they, res they responded with loud expletives. And I said, what, what were the expletives? And he said to them afterwards, he said, well, the first word was mother and the second word wasn't. <laughs> um, but, but as a result of that, they're now deploying end-to-end -end encryption, they're making it. They're making mass surveillance much more costly um, uh, for um, for governments around the world, and it's not just governments and democracies, or not even principally governments and democracies. I mean, the advantage of reforms at the technological level is that uh, while protecting our freedoms um, in the West, um, they also make it easier for dissidents to operate in places like Russia and China. So those uh, countries where you're not going to see the same kind of democratic debate that is there, th there can still be that. Um, but we have seen, not just in the United States, um, courts considering challenges in the UK. Um, we've seen some legal challenges that never could have uh, succeeded before. I think we've seen an emboldened press and media. Um, I, I've been really impressed by um, the courage and skill of the reporters who have been bringing these stories um, to the public. Um, you know, all of these are you know kinds of oversight. You know, the problem of secrecy and intelligence in a democracy isn't one that can be solved. Um, you know, it's one that is always going to be fought. Um, and the best we can do 
um, is empower those parts of our democracies that do oversight um, over secret intelligence systems. Um, at least in the United States, all of those entities that do oversight, our Congress, our courts, our media, the technology companies now, have been strengthened and empowered since the Snowden revelation um, at the expense um, of the power and authority of the intelligence community. It doesn't mean they have a glass jaw. Uh, it doesn't mean that we won. Um, we're not going to win. Um, we don't win. Um, the question is, are we closer to getting this balance right? Uh, and I think we are. Great. So uh, why don't we take some comments and questions? I'm, I'm going to say right off the bat, there are a lot of people here. We've got short period of time, so I'm going to be ruthless and ask you to just please state a, a question very succinctly, and if you go beyond 30 seconds, I'm going to cut you off. So we have microphones that we can pass around, so maybe we could go to the very back over there. Thanks. Now we're, we're going over here first. Yeah. Okay. Oh, you can't hear? Okay, thank you for that. Uh, one of the core elements of the surveillance program is that they say that we give up our civil liberties for greater protection. Uh, could you put some clarity over the extent to which the surveillance program has actually sort of stopped any terrorist attacks from happening? Because both sides, you hear different things. Some, some reports say that they haven't been able, there's no evidence that they've been able to stop anything, while some people within the government say that um, there are indications that evidence has been attained that have stopped and prevented terrorist attacks. So is there any consensus or any clear clarity around that? Yeah, it's, it's, you know, of course it's not possible for us who are outside the secrecy bubble to know everything that, that people inside know. I can tell you that in the U.S., the claims that have been made by the intelligence community about terrorist attacks that have been prevented um, have um, changed dramatically. We heard immediately after the Snowden revelations that the, the telephone metadata program had stopped uh, or interfered with 54 terrorist plots or attacks. Uh, that number eventually was reduced to one, um, and the NSA admits it, and that one was a uh, Somali immigrant in the United States who made a wire transfer of about $8,000 to the Shabaab, uh, which probably would have been found out even without the metadata program and probably is not a very serious uh, terrorist crime to justify building an entire infrastructure of mass surveillance. Now, surely there are other programs as well, um, but I think that the you know, the truth is that mass surveillance programs are not a great fit for terrorist prevention. Um, it's pretty hard to uh, detect a terrorist plot in advance and prevent it. And I think we have to understand that in free societies, that if a, a handful of people who know each other well, a married couple in San Bernardino, California, friends and cousins in Paris or Brussels, um, are, are able to communicate directly with each other, can cause some mayhem with light weapons, uh, there's not a whole lot that governments can do, certainly using technology, to prevent that from happening. And, and there's no evidence that constructing a massive, massive, massive haystack of human lives makes it any easier to find those very, very few needles. There are not a lot of terrorists um, out there. You know, what these databases are quite good at um, is forensic reconstruction of what's happened. Um, so if you're collecting all of the world's communications and something occurs, you know, you can hit rewind. Um, and, you know, that's why these technologies are so attractive, um, not just to spies, but to police, to law enforcement. And you see in the Snowden documents the migration of these authorities from the NSA, which is about intelligence, to the FBI, to the Drug Enforcement Administration. Um, and that kind of migration, that kind of mission creep, I think is irresistible. Uh, and you will see that, especially since, because if there is another major terrorist attack in one of our societies, the information that could have prevented it will be residing in one of these databases. The government officials who control it will say, if only we didn't have these terrible restrictions on what we could look at, we would have stopped the attack. And then a law will be passed um, that allows everybody in, um, not just the people who are preventing terrorism. And so that's what happened in the US after 9-11 with the Patriot Act. Um, that's what will happen with the NSA's databases if there's um, another attack. And so I think when you, when you want to think about the harm and the danger of these kinds of programs, you can't take a snapshot of what today's activities are. You have to make a realistic assessment of how they're going to be used in the future. So over here, yes. Uh, there. Uh, there was a CBC article, and they were questioned about the terminology 
manufactured terrorism. Uh, can you elaborate on that? The CBC article referenced that the FBI was the organization responsible over 20 years for the most terrorism plots. Can you please elaborate? Sure, that that's something. I mean, I, I, I think that what the articles, I'm not familiar with the article. Um, it is certainly the case that in most of the terrorism arrests um, in the United States uh, over the last decade, um, uh, the plots were initiated by undercover FBI agents who were luring um, other people into conspiracies. Uh, and, and you know, you might have different views about this. Um, in some instances, it might be a legitimate tactic. In a lot of instances, it seems like they were really preying on, uh, on, on weak people who didn't have the will or the capability to carry out serious attacks. Um, but there's a lot of pressure on the FBI to, to make cases. Um, and yeah, I mean, it is, it is remarkable, um, uh, the near unanimity of cases that involve you know, FBI agents actually instigating the plots that they then come in and arrest and partly punish people for. Well, one of the more interesting cases in this area is around the child pornography scam recently, where it appears as if the FBI maintained a child porn database to lure people into it and then attack them. Yeah, and I'm sure there are people who will say, um, you know, Making child pornography involves real children, which is an evil thing to do, and that's why we allow it to be criminalized. Um, anybody who goes uh, you know, into one of these dark web child pornography sites knows exactly where he's going. Um, so we shouldn't have a whole lot of you know, sympathy for that kind of person. But we do have to worry about what happens when our law enforcement agencies um, essentially become criminals to catch criminals. Um, and, and I think that a lot of the sort of draconian punishments that come down on child pornography and all the pressure, you know, comes from this mistaken view that anybody who looks at one of those images is a predator in waiting, and the, the evidence doesn't support that. We I, we probably shouldn't go too far down this this hole here, um, but but also legally, you know, the FBI used one warrant to the judge um, in order to send malware out into what thousands of computers. Um, clearly, the judge didn't know exactly what the FBI was going to be doing. So, um, you know, as a lawyer, I think, you know, how do we educate judges uh, about what it is that they're being asked to do? Yes, up here. Two quick things. <coughs> the first one is a clarification. When Snowden was charged with espionage, uh, who was he spying for, the American public? As a charge, like as a charge, what did they say? Who was he spying you, for? You, it, the charge, the, the, the violation of the Espionage Act doesn't require you to be acting for a foreign power. Um, all it requires is that you were entrusted with national defense information and you provided it to anyone who's not authorized to receive it. Um, so that could be uh, a reporter, it could be the American public, it could be anyone else. And of course, you know, the challenge with secrecy and democracy is there's no way to give information to the public without also giving it to everyone in the world and enemies. So, so that's, that's actually a real problem. It's not um, uh, something where there are no interests on the other side. Um, but under this law, you don't have to be charged with uh, being an agent of a foreign power. And in fact, the problem with it is that it doesn't distinguish between giving information to a journalist in the public interest and selling it to a foreign power for profit. And this is a quick question. Um, are there any legal implications for the U.S. government internationally? So just by knowing that um, they surveilled uh, Brazil or Merkel's phone or anything like that, are there any international charges or any international implications in terms of treaties or anything? There certainly has been diplomatic fallout, but here's the challenging point for people around the world and what they need to hear. Uh, the main difference between the U.S. and other countries' intelligence agencies is capability, um, not legal constraint. Uh, that none of these countries have laws that prohibit them from listening to Barack Obama's cell phone uh, or doing mass surveillance in the United States. They just don't have the capability to do it. Uh, and this is what, you know, when we complain to U.S. intelligence officials about the extent of mass surveillance overseas, they say, okay, show us what country has better laws than we do for preventing surveillance overseas. Uh, and then we say this. So someone's gonna need to step forward 
um, not by making the law worse, like C51, but by making it better uh, and saying, let's put forward a global model for how we can have reasonable restrictions on what we're going to do overseas. Can I just follow that up and ask you, of the, let, let's just restrict it to the, to the five eyes, uh, who has the best system of oversight among them when it comes to the intelligence community? I'm just not sure I want to answer that on the record. <laughs> yeah, over here. The government uh, did some bad things because of Snowden's disclosure. They did some good things. And uh, we, you talked about democratic participation. And I wonder how much the layperson in America cares. Because the feedback that I've gotten listening to programs, they, it appeared to me that they don't get it. And they say things like, I have nothing to hide, I don't care. Uh, privacy is not an issue for me, it's only an issue for people who have something to hide. So I'm wondering um, the sacrifice for a population that doesn't really get it. Yeah, well, I think that everywhere I go, not just in the United States, I hear the argument, I have nothing to hide. Uh, and if they want to look at my email to stop terrorism, I'm okay with that. I don't think that's a uniquely American argument. But, but let me say this. Um, the United States House of Representatives, uh, more than 300 members, uh, and that includes you know, more than 100 Republicans, um, voted for the USA Freedom Act um, which was imperfect reform, um, but which ended the NSA's mass collection of telephone metadata in the United States. The members of Congress are responsive to their constituencies. Uh, they wouldn't have passed this law in those numbers uh, if they didn't think that it was the right political vote. Uh, and we haven't seen the same thing in other Western democracies and other Five Eyes countries where the Congress votes to actually make the law better instead of worse. Another thing that you may be less aware of um, in the United States is that there's a real trend at the state level um, to rein in out-of-control surveillance practices by local law enforcement. Um, so we've seen more than a dozen states um, require law enforcement to get a warrant before tracking the location of a cell phone. Um, that's a trend that is supported as much from the right as it is from the left. Um, and in fact, the states that are passing this first tend to be more Tea Party associated states, you know, Montana, Wyoming, Utah, not at first New York, Massachusetts. Um, so, so there really is a constituency um, in the United States for privacy. You know, do I wish that it were more of a mass constituency? Absolutely. Um, but, you know, you don't necessarily need 51% of the population to be mobilized and on your side to make social change. Uh, if that were the case, um, it would be hard to make progress on any of these issues. What we need um, are groups of very committed activists um, who care passionately about these issues uh, to push for change. Um, you know, one example here, you know, the National Rifle Association, which gets its way in the United States Congress, um, doesn't have close to majority support in the U.S. for its position, um, is, is below 50% on any measure, and yet they're so committed to that issue uh, that they're able to instill fear in politicians and, and, and pass the legislation they want. So uh, maybe we can take a page from that book. It's, it's interesting also, you know, you mentioned this about it, it inspires activists and the information now being in the public domain, I think it provides ammunition and fodder for uh, groups and individuals even outside of the United States to push for, for change and accountability. I, I think in particular about the cell phone simulation, the stingray devices and so on, how that, as you rightly point out, there's been extraordinary progress there, I'd say, uh, in part uh, due to the work of the ACLU. Um, and here in Canada, we start asking questions now. Okay, well, what, if this is going on down there, what about in our country? And we find out, well, there's a big black hole here. We know there's the technology, we don't really know how it's being used. And so we can ask by focusing on a comparison and say, this is the standard down there, what is it here? Beyond uh, the question of the, uh, democracy, I, I'm really building on what the uh, lady said a moment ago. 
What is the ACLU's position on what the Constitution of the United States allows, given that we see uh, Donald Trump, we're seeing Ted Cruz to talk about the democratic hopes for the future to making things better. I mean, the ACLU presumably has a constitutional position on what should be uh, allowed under the current circumstances. What is that? With respect to surveillance? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Because we have constitutional positions on hundreds of issues related to the future of democracy. Yeah. So, so to be as simple as possible, you know, our view is the Constitution says that suspicion should come before search and seizure, not search and seizure before suspicion. Now, the rationale for these mass surveillance programs is let's collect it all, put it over there, so that when we need it someday, when someone comes under suspicion, we can reconstruct that person's movements, his associations, his friendships, and all of that, uh, and use that against that person and others. Um, our view is that that is the very definition of what the framers of our Constitution called a general warrant. Uh, that, that what they objected to was the practice of the Crown of intercepting mail, communications, papers, reading through all of them until they found evidence um, of uh, criminality or uh, opposition to the Crown, and then pursuing legal charges. So, uh, so we think that the whole structure of mass surveillance has it backwards. We, we made very strong constitutional arguments in our challenge to the phone metadata program. The court didn't need to reach them, and it didn't need to reach them because it said, this program is illegal non -res you know, without respect to the Constitution. This program is illegal because Congress never even authorized it. Um, so we didn't get a ruling in our case on the Constitution, but there is another judge in Washington, D.C. Um, who called the NSA phone tracking program unconstitutional and Orwellian. Um, so it's possible that we will still get some constitutional rulings in these cases. But our basic view is um, the Constitution says that you should be left alone unless the government thinks has good reason to think that you're up to something wrong. Um, that should be you know, the basic standard. And um, it's not in my pocket. It has a sticker that says, get a warrant. In the United States, you have the FISA court with the, the judges. Uh, how robust is that? I mean, I've, I've heard some people talk about the, the fact that it's a bit of a rubber stamp, and you've seen uh, uh, maybe only a few circumstances where they've They've uh, resisted any type of application. Um, how do you see so, it? So the, the, the FISA court is a specialized foreign intelligence court. The FISA court is not the court that the government can use to do ordinary surveillance within the United States. Uh, it's the court that they go to if they are doing surveillance for an intelligence purpose, not for a criminal purpose. Um, so it's, it's um, look, there's been a lot of criticism of the FISA court, a lot of it justified. You know, one of the criticisms is that it acts in secret. Well, if all it's doing is issuing warrants for surveillance, of course it acts in secret. All courts act in secret when they're issuing warrants. Um, uh, it's, it's not the practice of any government to notify somebody that there's a surveillance warrant on them. It wouldn't work. The problem with the FISA court um, is that um, during the Bush administration, its role changed without any real authorization. So instead of the FISA court issuing individual warrants in individual cases, it started authorizing programmatic surveillance. It started writing opinions that interpreted federal laws, that interpreted the Constitution. And it did that in secret without any adversarial process. It would get an argument from the government and then nothing from the rest of us. You know, We were outside banging on the door, sort of trying to get the FISA court to let us file briefs in cases. And um, we weren't allowed to do that. And so the, uh, these programs that the FISA court was authorizing in secret, now that they're being investigated by open federal courts with people arguing on both sides, you're getting rulings that come out the opposite way. Um, in the USA Freedom Act, which I've referred to, there's a new process um, where the court appoints representatives of the public to make arguments against the government in these important cases. Uh, we don't know how that's going to work yet. It's brand new, but it's, it's an improvement. You mentioned C-51. I wasn't going to ask you about Canada, but uh, <laughs> since you brought it up... I'm going to turn it back around on you. Okay, well, well let, let's uh, get into it. So, the, you know, we, we had C-51. We have a new uh, government in power here that actually uh, uh, promoted C-51, or backed it at least. And uh, now there is discussion of, well, maybe we can make some revision to it. And I think this is a positive development because it opens up the question of, you know, what type of oversight would be good here in the parliamentary system that we have? 
so in contrast to the United States, where and you outlined nicely, I think, in addition to the FISA court, all these other layers of oversight, when it comes to our NSA, we have uh, one retired judge, uh, the CSE commissioner, who once a year does a review uh, to confirm that the CSE is acting in accordance with the government's own interpretation of the law. So clearly this is a faulty system. And now we're discussing, well, what could we do? Uh, do you have any opinion on, if you're going to give advice to the Canadian government, what would be the, you know, or to the Canadian citizenry, uh, what should we be doing here? You know, the, the problem is that this fight has to be refought once a generation. So that in the 1970s, we had an extraordinary debate about surveillance in the United States. We had a, a bipartisan committee in Congress called the Church Committee that, that did a multi-year investigation of um, the surveillance practices of the NSA, the CIA, the FBI, all of these agencies wrote a magnificent report about it. Um, and the result of that was a law, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. We've just been talking about the FISA court. It was created. That was the reform. Now we're talking about it as the problem. Um, right? I mean, what you need are empowered courts that are independent. Um, you need members of parliament who have access to everything. Um, and who are there to do oversight, not to rubber stamp. I mean, the problem in the United States is that over the decades, the intelligence committees in Congress, which were also created after the church committee, um, became taken over for the most part by the members who were most sympathetic to the intelligence community, not the most um, uh, adversarial towards it, with some exceptions. You had people like Senator Wyden, in, um, who, who you see in this, in this movie. But so, yeah, so you need strong and independent courts um, you need advocates who have access to the classified information. Um, you need to have members of parliament who really care um, about getting this right. And then you need to have strong civil society organizations like yours that are continuing to put the pressure on. And they also need evidence of abuse of power, a Watergate, which really triggers something like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think that, that, that sometimes, and I think the problem is that mass surveillance is so much more abstract than the kinds of surveillance harms that we saw with goons like J. Edgar Hoover in the United States. Everyone can understand what happens when the secret police you know, try to blackmail a civil rights leader um, uh, or um, you know, use the apparatus to eavesdrop on Supreme Court justices. Um, but it's, it's harder to see the abuses from collecting information on everyone. Well, listen, this has been uh, absolutely extraordinary uh, for to see this many people come out to see that documentary and so many people who actually hadn't seen it before. And to think here we are almost three years after these uh, revelations were first disclosed, there's still uh, such an interest in this topic. And I think that was due in no small part to you uh, coming up here. I just want to say on behalf of not only everyone here, but me personally and, and the staff of the Citizen Lab, uh, to thank you and by extension to thank uh, Ed Snowden uh, for, for all of what's gone on here because it's, it's been truly inspiring for us, rejuvenated uh, our work and, and hopefully in the long run will we'll bring about uh, greater democratic accountability. So thank you very much, Ben, for coming to Toronto. Thanks, Ron. Thanks, everybody.